Hi, I'm Mike Sullivan. Thanks for joining us today on MO, where we feature small business owners and entrepreneurs, and then bring you hints, tips, insights, and perspectives on what it takes to be successful. Joining us today is Mike Ragsdale. He considers himself to be a habitual entrepreneur. He's worked with large companies such as AOL Time Warner and Playboy, as well as many others. He's joining us today to talk about his latest venture, townwizard.com. Um, the goal of the new company is to help small town entrepreneurs seize the mobile app opportunity. Mike, thanks for joining us. Um, if you could, can you start out by telling us a bit about your background and leading up to Town Wizard? Sure. I um, uh, went to school at the University of Alabama, got a master's degree in advertising and PR. And when I got out of college, I uh, sent out resumes like everybody else and uh, expected this landslide of offers to come in and they didn't come. Uh, not only was there no landslide, there was hardly a, a trickle of anything. So um, I was sitting out there at, at my apartment kind of thinking, what am I going to do? Um, I'm not getting these job offers like I thought I was going to do. Uh, and so I called a friend of mine who had landed that quote unquote dream job in um, an ad agency. And I asked him, I said, so uh, what do you think I should do? Do you know of anything going on over there? Is there any, any opportunities? And he said, well, how much are you making doing your consulting? Because I was doing consulting on the side. And I said, you know, I mean, and by consulting, I mean designing newsletters, whatever, whatever I could do to cobble together a, a living. And I said, well, you know, I'm probably making, I don't know, 18000 a year or something like that. And he said, where are you? Where are you right now? And I said, well, I'm out at the pool, you know, at the apartment. And he said, I'm making 22000 a year, and I'm sitting in a suit in a cubicle. So you do the math. And, and that got me thinking that, you know, there was, uh, there was some benefit to not being in that tie and not being in that cubicle. So I actually took out a small business loan, and this was around 1994, got a Macintosh computer. It uh, came with this little thing called an AOL disk, which at the time every computer in the world was coming with. AOL was unheard of. They were unknown. But I got this thing and was really blown away by what uh, it, it potentially represented. So I began uh, to use it. This is before the web existed, really. I mean, this uh, AOL was in third place behind CompuServe and Prodigy uh, and Microsoft. No, none of those players had entered the internet space yet. So I uh, made a pitch to AOL, a business idea. Kind of forgot about it. About three months later, I got a call from somebody um, in their uh, Tyson's Corner offices in, in D.C., and they asked us to come up and, and talk about it, so I did. And long story short, we basically got AOL to invest uh, some money in our startup, um, uh, grew it for the next six or seven years from a, uh, me and a couple friends to a pretty, pretty sizable content building studio uh, for AOL as well as uh, companies like Playboy, Microsoft. Um, we were kind of a, uh, some of the pioneers of online community building and we didn't know to call it social media back then but, but in essence that's what it was. So I did that for many years. Uh, we got out at a very good time. Um, then got into a couple businesses that were just had no business being in literally they were not successful and that's because I lost my focus on what I do best and, and thought well this is easy boy look how easy it is to make money and got out there and did things that I wasn't passionate about I did, was doing it just because it was entrepreneurial just because it was uh, looked like an easy way to make money and so I learned a lot of valuable lessons from those failures and then uh, at a certain point decided to pick up and move to the beach and uh, got down here and started enjoying more of a laid-back lifestyle. And again, that's precisely when things happen, when you do what you're passionate about and you do what you love. Um, I started a little site just as a hobby um, that became a local guide to what's going on here at the beach. And it began gaining traction, gaining momentum, uh, growing in fans. Uh, so we started a Facebook page, and we've gone you know, a few dozen friends to, I think, 47,000 as of this morning. And this is in a town that's got 10,000 residents, you know, so uh, uh, it, it's not a very big place uh, and certainly not on the map in the grand scheme of things. Um, but that said, then we built this company that helps other small town entrepreneurs launch businesses in their towns, take advantage of the mobile guide opportunity. And that's how townwizard.com came about. That's great. Hey, am I correct in that you sold a company to AOL? 
That's right. Um, yeah, back in in the days of the, uh, the it was Heckler's Entertainment was the name of the company. We started out with an online comedy site, and that was what we were always known for because it was the first thing we did. Um, it was really kind of the world's first interactive comedy site, and what that essentially meant was is we weren't the comedians. Uh, we didn't know it, but we were pioneering the concept of user-generated content. It had never existed before, and that's what caught AOL's attention in our business plan was that. You know, David Letterman has a staff of writers, and sometimes they're funny, sometimes they're not. What if we let the world be our writers? So we would post, we had dozens, I mean, we were the most successful launch in AOL's history up to that date. Um, we um, had, we could post a topic, and let's just say it was a top 10 list. We could post a topic like top 10 names, rejected names from Madonna's baby or something like that, and we would get thousands and thousands and thousands of responses in a couple hours and then our editors all they had to do was go through and pick the ones that made them laugh and then we learned how to shine the spotlight on these users and give them prizes give them recognition so every day you were guaranteed that you were gonna laugh because you literally had tens of thousands of people participating in these online games so hecklers was our first interactive brand and then of course AOL was kind of taken aback that uh, uh, a bunch of rednecks in, in rural Alabama had figured this out. So I think they, they kept asking us to create more and more things. So we began building, we built a video game site, we built a sci-fi site, we built trivia games. So we were kind of this uh, little studio that created these branded online communities that had very passionate uh, followers and fans. And we didn't know it, but we were really building... The, the concept of community, the concept of stickiness is what they began to call it later on, but ultimately it's social media. You know, it's, it's, building con it's building a community around a concept, whether it's humor or a location or a band or a town. Um, and, and that was really the early days of it, and that's kind of what brought us here, you know, to this point. Looking back on the time you spent with a company like AOL, what, what's your perspective? What, do you, what are your feelings today looking back? Well, I think, you know, uh, and I'm not belittling anything or, or, or uh, any of the people at AOL. They were all very smart people. But I think coming from right out of college, you know, and you suddenly go to these big offices uh, in, in Washington, D.C. Or, or in Arlington or, or Dulles, and you're overwhelmed by the massiveness of it, you know. And I think that the immediate assumption was that everybody here is extremely intelligent, extremely bright. These guys, you were almost scared to be there. You know what I mean? You, you felt like you didn't belong there, that, that you, we were out of our league. And the more we got around them, uh, the more we began to realize that we did contribute something. We did, we did have something of value. We did see it in a different way. Uh, and I think Ted Leonsis, who was kind of our mentor, you know, and he's, uh, Ted, if you've never heard of him, is a, a serial entrepreneur himself. And he not only was instrumental in AOL's success in those days, but um, subsequently has been a huge uh, uh, backer of Groupon, numerous other companies as well. He owns the Washington Wizards and the Washington Capitals, uh, owns the Coliseum that they play in, etc. So, you know, he, he's a very successful entrepreneur and he was our inspiration and he invested in our company because he recognized that we saw it in a different way. We weren't thinking two-dimensionally, okay? And he, and he all often said it wasn't Rolling Stone magazine that started MTV. It wasn't Sports Illustrated that capitalized on the cable market. It was ESPN. It, whenever there's a new medium, there are new players that emerge, Okay, it's not the old established players that get it. They they typically are are kind of set in their path. So it takes young, fresh entrepreneurial ideas uh, when a new market emerges to fully capitalize on it and to show people the new direction. So I think that in the, we're especially seeing that now. We saw it a couple of years ago in the social media space, you know, Facebook, etc. And we've seen what young, fresh talents came in and, and did with that space. I think we're seeing that now in the mobile marketing space. And I don't mean young as a number of years. I just mean young in terms of your your outlook on 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 an industry. So I think that mobile marketing, we're about to see the same sort of explosive growth. We're starting to see the same sort of innovation, and. Uh, um, you know, at AOL, it was that very much a pioneering sense of, uh, of spirit and discovery. 
And um, that was what made it invigorating and exciting. And it was a very entrepreneurial environment to work in up until it became this massive behemoth uh, and became very corporate. And that that's when they started running into problems. Okay, so tell me about Town Wizard. Where did this idea evolve from and where is it at today? Right, so I have a, a local website called 30a.com. 30a is a highway here, okay, kind of like saying Route 66. And it, it ties together a bunch of uh, beach communities, beach resort areas. So it's a, it's a wonderful place, uh, and, and it's really very uh, Caribbean-like waters and white sand. It's kind of a hidden gem here in the United States. Uh, it was just named one of the top ten beaches in the world uh, by Frommers this year. So, And the only other location in the United States was in Hawaii. So it really is a hidden jewel. Um, but what happened is, as I developed this... Um, interactive guide, not only the website but the mobile apps, I began to be approached by entrepreneurs or at least people, enthusiasts in other cities and saying, hey, have you thought about doing something like that in the French Quarter? Have you thought about doing something like that in Key West or Savannah? And, you know, Mark Twain said, write what you know about, and I really don't know anything about those markets. And so it, it began to occur to me is, you know, Google doesn't either, and, and Facebook doesn't either, and, and Groupon doesn't either. They're never going to know those markets as well as a local. Now, if you're in New York, San Francisco, Chicago, yeah, all of those um, Groupon also are very useful. But you come to Santa Rosa Beach, Florida, or Coleman, Alabama, or Carlsbad, California, or some of these smaller areas, it just doesn't apply. And at the end of the day, there are entrepreneurs in each of those towns that want to take advantage of the mobile opportunity. So what we decided, rather than us trying to conquer each of those markets and to become experts in a town that I don't live in, let's empower locals with the same tools that I've already developed, all right? The same Android app template, the same iPhone app template, the same CMS, the same uh, marketing collateral, the same marketing strategies. Let's give those to entrepreneurs so they have a three-year head start and they don't have to spend tens of thousands of dollars and many, many months, if not years, to catch up. And not only that, we not only do we give them all the tools, but you've got 125 other entrepreneurs like yourself, all op capitalizing on the same opportunity. So when somebody in Austin, Texas discovers something that works, we immediately disseminate it to all of our partners. And that way, you know, we can discover something that works in Paducah, Kentucky, and suddenly the guy in Atlanta and the guy in Napa Valley and the guy in um, Tampa can capitalize on the same opportunity and idea the next day. How are you uh, advertising or marketing the business or do you have any uh, unique marketing strategies you can share with us? It's, it's fun because, you know, it's kind of like I'm every day I'm surrounded by 120 other like-minded entrepreneurs. So, and I mentioned Paducah, Kentucky, you know, a mobile apps are kind of, you know, what we're uh, helping our partners get launched. And he had a great idea, you know, so he, he, I don't know him personally, but he's a financial analyst or something. And he said, you know, I had this idea that I'm going to go out. There's only six mobile phone stores here. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to make an offer to those mobile phone stores. I'm going to pay you $2 per phone that you install my app on, okay, the Paducah Kentucky app. And he said, all of them accepted. And so now every time they're installing, you know, a phone or setting up somebody's phone, do you want the local app? Do you want the Paducah app? Of course they do. So, you know, he recognizes that for $2 investment, he will be able to capitalize on that audience for, for years and decades, potentially, you know, but with all the marketing opportunities, et cetera. So it's a great investment for him. So as we heard that idea, we thought, brilliant. So we disseminated it to everybody so that all of our other partners can take advantage of the same concept. In your experience, what's the most important factor in achieving success? Well, I, I, at the end of the day, I think it's number one, being authentic. And it's being, um, it's, you know, where I live, it's kind of a beach resort area. Again, so there's only 10,000 people that live here full time. In the summer, it's slam packed. You could shoot a cannon in here in October and not hit a soul. Okay, so there's only three or four months out of the year where it's highly populated. Um, but people have a passion for this area. Once they, this is, they save up their vacation days all year long just to come spend a week here. So I kind of liken it to Jimmy Buffett in a way. You know, he is self-admittedly a, a, a very mediocre singer. 
Um, he's a you know mediocre guitar player at best. But what he did was he connected with the desire in probably 80, 90 percent of the world's population to retire on some tropical beach somewhere and to drink Mai Tais or margaritas. Uh, it's a fantasy that most of us have at some point. So he gives us that, you know, lifeline while we're sitting in our cubicles, you know, in freezing Baltimore or freezing, uh, uh, you know, Sioux City or whatever. He's that he's that connection we have to that vision of where we want to be. So with 30A, for example, I decided, you know, that on a micro level, that needs to be my role here is I need to keep people connected with this place that they already love. So I think part of the trick to the success is don't over market your own brand or your own products. Bring something of value to the fans. Okay, so in my case, I can I sit there and watch. If I make a post and it's self-serving, okay, I'm selling t-shirts or I'm doing this or I'm doing that, I can see the response is not nearly as exciting as if I go out on my YOLO on my stand-up paddleboard and capture some some footage of dolphins swimming past and I post that and there's no ulterior motive. They love it. I mean, you know, it becomes viral very quickly because that's why they watch me. Okay, that's why they watch 30A. They want to be there with the dolphins. They want to see that sunset uh, over the water. So I think that it's understand what your audience wants. Do not look at Facebook as a... So many people have said, man, that must really drive a lot of traffic to your web page. And honestly, I could care less about driving traffic to my web page. Facebook is its own thing. I view... I'm not building a website. I'm building a brand. Okay, and as long as people are having a positive experience when they interact with my brand, I'm happy. So if they come to my Facebook page and never go to my website, I could not possibly care less. If they go to my website but never download my iPhone app, I could not possibly care less. It's great if they do, but you don't try to view Facebook as a way to funnel people to another location. Look at it as a as a tool for interacting with people who are interested in what you're doing. Don't try to sell them something. Try to bring something of value to them. And ultimately, you'll develop a relationship with them, and they will swat your hand. Honestly, they will swat your hand if you step out of line. I decided early on with my Facebook page that I was going to be 100% positive. Okay, I was never going to trash a restaurant. I was never going to say, I wasn't going to focus on all the bad news. If you want bad news, you can pick up the newspaper. You can turn on the TV. This is where... Everything's happy, everything's good, everything's fun. Well, last year, you might have heard about this little oil spill that happened, you know, and, and you know, I live at the beach, not too far away, um, fortunately just far enough away to where we were not directly impacted, but the media attention killed us. I mean, it abs- we only get three or four months out of the year to make our money here, okay? It's during the summer months, and all of the media hype absolutely killed us. Reservations were canceling right and left, down 50%. Businesses were killed. And there was hardly a drop of anything that ever reached our beaches. Okay, That said, the perception is there. So, you know, I basically, at a certain point, thought, you know, this is real. This is starting to happen. I started to freak out a little bit myself. I had not ignored it. I just decided that was up to the, the news companies to focus on for a while. But when it became something that you couldn't ignore anymore, I remember stepping outside and saying, okay, I'm going to have to address this. And the minute I did, my audience corrected me. The minute I started to preach, if you will, about what was going on, my audience said, look, we know it's happening. It's everywhere. This is the one place we can forget about it. This is the one place where I can still think about dolphins and sunsets. Please, if I want that other stuff, I'll go over here to get it. So I think it's important to know what your audience wants from you and to just keep giving it to them. Thanks for talking to us today, Mike. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. Bye-bye.